Hey. You like cars? <sighs> okay. Well, as you can see from the view, I'm back traveling again. I'm not, you know, I'm not too far away this time, but I'm not home. And I'm back in a hotel. But the podcast never stops. So you already know what this is. Episode 37, Car Quicks. How y'all feeling? How the loved ones? How your family, the kids, the jobs, whatever it may be, I hope it's going well for you. It's going well for me. I don't have my normal backdrop. I don't have my normal accoutrements, but we're still going to get this party started. So we're driving right in, okay? Straight to the news. What do we got? Porsche, the Panamera. So the Panamera has been redesigned. Not really redesigned. That's a bad choice of words, okay? Because it really isn't redesigned at all. It's been tweaked. A little bit. It's got a better front end. The rear end's a little sharper. They basically tightened up everything, right? A little tighter, you know, around the hips. But the base of the vehicle is still the same, and it's still very, very good. If you don't know what the Panamera is, you clearly live under a rock. I don't know what else to tell you. Clearly, Porsche is betting on this being one of their staples. But there's a big thing that's happening this time around, and that's because they are pushing further towards luxury. Porsche is known for their sports cars. Like We don't have to explain that anymore. They already got it. They got it in the bag. But for the Panamera, they're pushing more towards luxury. I'm going to tell you how. So right now, the base of the new Panamera for 2024 is 110000 which is <laughs> shocking, honestly. I really thought this thing started at like seventy five. I was mistaken. But 348 horsepower, turbo V6. I don't know if it's a twin turbo, if it's a single. But 368 foot-pounds of torque. Top speed of 168 or 169 miles an hour. Depending on if you have a Porsche Panamera or if you have the Panamera 4, which is all-wheel drive. Both do 0 to 60, 4.7 to 5 seconds. Obviously, the all-wheel drive one does it faster. There is inevitably going to be e-hybrid versions which the top of the trim being the turbo e-hybrid which will have a 670 horsepower 685 foot pound torque twin turbo v8 with 140 kilowatt battery so that particular model guaranteed to be over two hundred thousand dollars. like get your ducks in order get your monopoly chips get your bread up that's going to be expensive. Zero to 60 on the turbo one isn't hasn't been spoken about, but take some wild guesses. 3.3 seconds, 200 mile an hour top speed. You know, the, the standard for the turbo e-hybrid. If you're looking at the current Panamera and you see the price on that one, I mean, it kind of all lines the same when it comes to the turbo model. But really, the the party trick this time is about something with the suspension now porsche has always had pasm which stands for porsche porsche active suspension management every porsche has had that option on the panamera it's now standard it's for a reason so that's basically the system that gives you a stiffer more taut handling feeling when you're in the Panamera and you put it in sport mode. When you put it in comfort mode, it softens everything up. Easier to drive, easier to live with. But they've taken it a step further and they've introduced something called Porsche Active Ride. Now, normally when you see anything about suspension and Porsche and Active Ride, our initial instincts tell us we're talking about better handling. We're talking about tighter control. We're talking about Jumping into the apex later, more speed, more control, but that's not the case here. And that is where we're taking a little bit of a different turn with the Panamera. See, normally Panamera, or actually normally Porsche, is synonymous with sports cars, high-performing one. GT3s and 911s come to mind first and foremost, as opposed to the Cayennes and the Panameras, and I'm talking about that for the car enthusiasts. For the people that drive Cayennes and Panameras only, they that's probably all they think about, okay? But here's where the active ride comes in. Whenever you're driving in the car, right, we've all been in the car, 
You hit the accelerator, you lean back, you know, Fat Joe style. <laughs> if you go into a corner, you lean into the side, you know, lean with it, you're rocking with it. This is what you're doing in the car, okay? Now, when you come to a stop, you feel it goes forward. When you're getting over bad roads, you feel it rocking back and forth. So whenever you're in a car, you feel all the things that it's doing. What this system is designed to do is to isolate the driver and the passengers, the occupants inside of the car from all of that. Meaning you don't feel anything. When the car turns, when it hits a corner that leans in, you're no longer leaning and rocking with it. You're perfectly stable. You're still. It's as if you're on a gyro, a gyroscope. The car's doing something on the outside. You're not doing anything. You're sitting there perfectly flat as can be, like you floating in a spaceship or something. Now, how can they do this, right? So what it uses is each of the shock absorbers in this active ride set setup are hydraulically assisted. And Porsche's computer system very precisely, probably within milliseconds, is maneuvering and changing, obviously, the pressure and the fluid in those shocks to change and move the suspension free of the body. Meaning, when you come to a corner, you lean in, the suspension will shift to keep the body completely flat. That is its goal. The goal is to make sure you don't feel anything that is drawing or pushing you to one side of the car. You stay flat. The suspension will articulate and do what it needs to do to keep the wheels planted to the ground. But you, you stay flat. Now, that's a very interesting take on this. Now, it's been done before. Mercedes-Benz has active ride in their luxury cars, which is the same concept. Though Porsche, from the articles I've read, many are saying they're leaning further into the technology and what it can do. One of the videos I saw, the dude was outside the car on a cell phone, looked like an iPhone or an Android phone, and was manipulating how the suspension was running and acting in the car. Similar to what we saw with the Maybach SUV, when everybody put it in that off-road mode and was just shaking back and forth. This thing was shaking, moving, squatting, all these type of things it was doing, and he was controlling it with the foam to the point where they can put the foam flat and move it side to side, up and down, and it was moving around, like for, I guess from the accelerometer and the phone activated to the car that it would show with pitch and dive it back and forth while it was, while it was standing there parked. That's really cool. Now, it's obviously doesn't serve any purpose when it's parked. That's really probably the party trick just to get people excited about the car. But it's a couple things it does, too, that no other car I've seen do. And that's one of them when you approach the car and open the door, it raises up to kind of meet you and your butt at a better height so you can get into the car better. And then when you close the door, you're sitting down, it lowers itself back down. So it's kind of like a, an assisted high chair. <laughs> For for a Porsche, you can get into the car and raise itself up. Now, the question is, who is this for? And the, what they're aiming at is for the customers that are looking for more comfort. If your goal is to have the best handling, you know, more focused Panamera, then you probably want like a Turbo S or you don't want this option at all if you add the active ride you are actively trying to make sure you don't feel anything on the ride okay you don't want to feel the road and its bumps and how it feels and everything like that you want to be isolated and be calm the reviews that i've read from the first drive they've done someone said it felt very unnerving or eerie or unsettling at first because if you're accelerating towards a corner and you press on the gas to feel the car decelerate, but you're just sitting there flat. It's odd. It almost feel like, I guess I'm going to equate this to maybe like a monorail train where you can accelerate and move. But like everybody else might be the train moving, but the body itself is just sitting perfectly flat on the track. Maybe that's similar to what it feels like. But the point of it is to isolate everybody. Now, the people that won't be isolated are those that want a Porsche Panamera Turismo because the wagon's gone and it's all y'all fault because see y'all didn't buy any see you didn't buy the Porsche Panamera wagon because you don't have any sense okay you should know that's the best looking one now the Porsche Taycan Turismo is still available I mean at the very least but the standard ice gas powered version they're not talking about and which means it got the axe which is unfortunate now 
I'm not in Porsche Panamera Turismo tax brackets or I would already have one. That or an R605, okay? Two of the greatest cars ever made. But the Porsche Turismo is no longer around for the Panamera model. No, you can't get to it. The interior is similar. It's been tweaked a bit. I did hear a good quote from a gentleman called Andrew P. Collins. He works for, he writes for The Drive. And one of the quotes he had about the interior of the Porsche, but it related to modern day cars, is he said, but like so many modern day cars, I feel like I'm looking at the back wall of a Best Buy when I'm behind the wheel of this thing. And that is something I've talked about when it comes to the digitizing of the dashboards or the digital dashes that you see everywhere. While it is very cool to have a digital display because of what you can manipulate and change on it, similar to what I can do in my GR Corolla, what you do not get a lot of times is that like a, that character, that art, that tactical feel of seeing the raised gauge clusters in the in the console like the tactical feel of the buttons you lose all of that right everything is a flat screen and gloss black which aesthetically extremely clean very modern but that statement he said is like how we get too far towards that what's ultimately what i feel like is going to happen is all these manufacturers are going to push and push and push and then they're going to come back and be like guess what guys we heard what you said and we're going to dial it back we're going to add buttons and bezels <laughs> to the car design and i mean it's like rinse and repeat right everybody went a modern clean open concept and now people are getting back to more of a traditional farmhouse look or something like that they're trying to get back to the architecture where something wasn't so modern and clean and open now we want something with some character some flaws if you you know if if that makes any sense, right? We want something that has something that we can feel and attach ourselves to. So the Panamera is coming out. The active ride is what you're going to see a bunch of Instagram videos showing. If I throw a video up here, you'll see it. If it's moving around and shaking when it's sitting there parked. And that's just Porsche showing you this is how the suspension moves and how it changes. And it does it. I say aggressive, but not aggressive in a bad way. I'm saying aggressive is that you're going to see a car move a lot. And you're going to say, oh, this is actually a true active ride suspension. Now, outside of Porsche doing that thing with the Panamera, ABT Sportsline. Now, if you don't know who ABT Sportsline is, I don't, you know, if you've been into like the Volkswagen Audi tuning scene, then you know who ABT Sportsline is I was into MK2 Volkswagens. Everybody knows about them. They are a huge brand. What they have essentially done is that they're making a Le Mans version of the R8, Audi R8 for the road. It is called the Audi R8 LMS GT2. It costs $653,000 or $706 at the end. So basically rounded up, $654,000, only 99 are being made. It is truly the ABT R8 race car on the road. They went as far as to adding side view mirrors, getting it crash tested, changing the fueling system and how it works. Because obviously when you make a race car, you're fueling it from cans. So you don't need to have the accessibility of like a gas door and gas cap like you would on a modern sports car or modern car. They tweaked and changed all that. And the crazy part is... It still manages to be only 3,086 pounds. That is with a 640 horsepower, 5.2 liter V10. You know this is going to be nasty. There's no other options. You can't have almost under 3,000 pounds, 640 in the V10. This just won't sound ferocious. So we'll wait to see. I don't know what they're going to do. If they're ever going to try to bring it to the U.S., it's not legal. So if anybody in the U.S. is looking to have a R8 Le Mans race car on their local coffee and cars, we ain't going to get it. So you're going to have to either import it or just look at it from a distance and dream, you know, have memories because that's all we got. Speaking of other cars that are dreams, <laughs> there was an article on Jalopnik that said, they found it funny that a thousand people gave poor gave I said Porsche. They gave Tesla a thousand dollars 
or no, sorry, a thousand people gave Tesla $250,000. And it was six years ago. Now, I don't know what's more shocking. The idea that I didn't realize six years had passed since the Tesla Roadster got shown or how fast time is moving. But Tesla got $250 million for a car that is as vapor as VIX. Okay, who, where is this car at? I remember when they were talking about the Tesla Roadster decimating the idea of what acceleration is i mean to the point that it was concerns about the people needing some aircraft carrier training in order to drive the car but they were talking big zero to 60 under 1.5 seconds some absurd number and then rima came out and made their own hypercar that was all electric the nevera and i was looking around like where is the roadster if it had all these claims i don't really know what's going to happen right i'm sure it will come out i'm sure it'll still be fast i'm sure it's going to be right behind the coattails of the cyber truck and that being released but i guarantee they're soon enough about to pull this out because if the cyber truck is coming and the tesla roadster has been talked about and people giving out codes to referral codes and i think somebody like marcus brownlee has theirs basically free from how many referral codes he had for buying teslas that somebody's gonna have to have this car in their hands at some point who knows where that lands as far as other electric cars go the on the ionic 5n from hyundai is making its rounds is being driven and the consensus from everybody, or not from everybody, from the few articles that I've read, has been, it's good. That it's one of the first electric cars, electric hatchbacks, that add that fun-to-drive aspect. That don't, that have a little bit of, you know, just a little, just a tinge of soul. Just a tinge. You know, even with the artificial sounds getting pumped through the speakers. But they're saying that it performs well. It's handling a track. It's driving normally. It's fast. However, the price tag is going to be the holdup because this thing is going to cost sixty-five to about seventy-five thousand dollars. Now, however much I think this Ionic Five N is cool, I'm not giving Hyundai seventy thousand dollars for an electric car. Y'all gonna have to prove yourself a tad bit more before we're coughing up that type of bread. But I hope to see one out on the street. And if I just had the unlimited funds to do whatever I wanted, I'd buy one to have it on the side. Like, why not? Now, as far as the news goes, I mean, there's not much else to add as far as the Porsche Pan America kind of being the biggest news. But there was a question that got posed online at some point, and it asked, like, what is your forever car? What is the car that you will buy and, like, die with, so to speak? And it got me thinking. I was like, what car would I have that falls in that category? And the GR Corolla... I guess can be close, but I haven't been with it long enough to form that close bond with it. And to have a forever car means you're trying to compete with everything that is coming, things that are inclement, like weather. You're trying to do the undoable in a way, right? And so I couldn't really think of a car. I'll be perfectly honest. I thought about Toyota Sequoia because I was like, well, at least I can overland it and get anywhere I want. But I want to really drive a Sequoia every single day if it's not for the reasons of going camping, off-roading, or having to get out of Dodge. Not necessarily. And the GR Corolla does fit the bill of what I've liked from Evos and STIs. And that's why I'm in that car. So I almost think that maybe it is my GR Corolla. That I'm, that's the one that I could live with forever and just be like, I'm done here. I get my fun. I get my all-wheel drive. But there is something to be said about some a car like an off-road that can do everything. Because most of the time, when people ask the question about what car you want to keep forever or what car you want to have to the end, there's some apocalyptic ways in there. Like, what if it hits the fan? What are you going to do? Listen, I can't throw everybody in a GR Corolla. I know we got all-wheel drive, but we might need some ground clearance to catch these curbs. <laughs> So it was a cool question to ask. Mine doesn't really fall anywhere special. I love the GR Corolla. I love a lot of other cars. But if you say right now which one to keep forever, it's going to be the GR Corolla. In New York, the last of the Crown Vicks is over. Supposedly, there was like two 
holdouts when it comes to all the taxi cabs in New York with the Crown Vic. Now, my father has a Grand Marquis, which has been has basically like 40,000 miles on it. This thing and these Crown Vics ran the world. I don't that might be the one car where you can honestly ask almost every single person and they probably ridden in one. Because that's how popular they were, especially if you're in New York and you took a cab. I mean, you drove in a Crown Vic. If you were <laughs> busy getting arrested, you drove in a Crown Vic. So that might be one of the cars that almost every human has been inside of. That'd be a cool story to look up. Outside of that tip, little bit of news, I mean, that's pretty much it. Oh, t- Ford has a new Celine coming out, the Celine Mustang. This is the Celine 302. And I really like the front end. Like, if you look at the front end on this picture, it's a very, very shark no- nose ish, but very clean. It has a little bit of a graphic on a wheel from the picture I see. Silver color is basic, but it looks clean. But it has a nice set. As far as the horsepower, it's 510 horsepower. I believe it uses a motor that's in the dark horse. And obviously, it's a good drivetrain, handles well. And it's good to see the name Celine still around when it comes to the Ford dealerships because, I mean, they're world renowned. If you don't know who Celine is when it comes to Mustang or the Celine S7, you are not really into the cars as deep as you need to be. Okay, you need to work on that. And that might be it right there. You know, like I said, I'm traveling. I'll be back at my normal place, my normal backdrop. But I do have some GR Corolla news. I told you I'm updating y'all every episode. And I threw on a new intake. So MST Performance is a company that makes performance intakes for a variety of cars. And they make one for the GR Corolla. And I got the opportunity to work with them because they sent me one to try out. And so far, so good. I mean, the turbo noises, the amount of turbo flutter, bypass valve, blow off valve is exponential it has been risen to a high level and i love it it was easy i don't want to say easy it was a fairly easy install except for a few two bolts that i wanted to eradicate from this earth that would give me a hard time got those off shot the whole video Videos up on my YouTube. So if you're listening to this podcast, you're like, well, let me go check out this GR Corolla this man keep talking about. Check out the YouTube channel, same name, Car Quicks, and you'll see my whole install video of the intake. But performance wise, Butt Dino tells me I got an extra bit in the mid range, right? It's hitting a little harder on the second, the third, fourth. I don't know how much it is, but there's a few videos out about the MST intake, and it's averaging between 15 and 20 horsepower. And I do believe it from what I feel. No, it's not anything astronomical, but like I said, the car already makes 300 horsepower. Extra 15 to 20, you're going to feel it somewhere. It may not be at the top end. So I threw that part on. It was cool to see, shot a video for it, did a couple of shorts. I got some other things I want to add to it as well and going to put on. I have a few other parts coming. Another is from DC Sports, old school name that anybody that was in the Honda Acura scene knows about DC Sports. And back in the day, they have some parts of the GR Corolla they're sending me or it should be delivered by the time I get back home. I have a new shift knob I want to try out for them. It's like Darylin, uh material. I have the li- We Are Likewise, you know, aluminum thick boy. But I'll be honest, heat in the summer, that thing has been pretty, you know, it's been a little bit of a journey trying to get into the car when it's blazing hot outside or freezing cold and start to get to shifting. And then I'm also getting their shifter cable bushings. Now, I have the 2J Racing shifter bushings. I don't know if the shifter cable bushings they have are introduced in a different manner or a different area i'm my brain is thinking somewhere in the cradle for the shifter semi where the cables come in or this is similar to the 2j racing bushings that i'm going to put in those and i'm going to see how it feels you know with those on there so that's something i have coming next i'm gonna shoot a little quick video on that it'll be simple and listen more of the parts are coming grow design the people I talked about a couple episodes ago who were killing me because Cusco was at the SEMA Auto Show and didn't say a word. Their stuff has been released with prices, though we don't know if it can come to America. That seems to be the issue we have now. Grow Design has been teasing us about their GR Corolla parts for a better part of a whole year. 
just for me to find out that some people have been reaching out to them and said, listen, you can't even get the parts in America because they won't work with any exporter or distributor. I wait, We the GR Corolla is aimed at the U.S. American market. How are we not getting no parts now? I don't know what the politics or all the logistics are with that. They may not want to work with exporters in the U.S. because they may not care and they don't need to. Because, listen, the Japanese, you know, audience will support some aftermarket car companies. We in America, we sometimes get caught up in ideologies and arguments and stuff online. And then all of a sudden somebody comes over here and tries to do something cool. People bash it, don't want it, don't want to pay the price or the premium. And next thing we know, they pack it up and leave. And we're like, yo, where'd y'all go? And, you know, more stuff will come next. I'm truly, I want to do something on the outside for aesthetics, either lowering it, but I don't, I'm such a stickler for lowering it without wheels. Then I'm looking at the front lip and I want to get a combination of two. It's just a lot of work, a lot of money that I got to save up and do. But in the meantime, in between time, I want y'all to do as you wish and do as you may. And remember, Cameron Biggs, your host, and this is Car Quicks. I'll see y'all around. Peace.